You're listening to the City World Radio Network, high definition digital radio broadcasting from the city to the world. www.cityworldradio.com. Good evening, and welcome to Morph Mom Moments Radio Show. What a special night with special guests at a special location. So you've tuned in on an amazing, amazing evening. Uh, we are live from the COCO in Summit, New Jersey, which is a new co-learning, co-working space. It's amazing. It's beautiful. And I absolutely recommend coming by. I am, uh, I am here with amazing guests from the Montclair Breast Center. And I'm going to introduce, I'm going to leave that as a teaser for a slight minute before I tell, before I want to just explain to you what you've gotten yourself into tonight. Uh, my name is Kathleen Smith. Welcome to Morph Mom Moments. Uh, I founded Morph Mom about eight years ago. I was in a bind. I'd been a prosecutor. I stopped to raise some kids, always thinking I would go back. Fourteen years later, I couldn't go back. They didn't really want me back. Didn't know what I was going to do. Law just seemed way too hard to get back into at the time, but it's all I knew. So started going down the rabbit hole, getting pretty depressed, could not figure out what I could, what I could do, what I wanted to do, um, what was even possible. So rather than reinvent the wheel, I could interview, having been a prosecutor, and I started to travel the country, and I started to interview women and see what they had done. Those who sort of been in a similar situation, thought out was avail- what was available, what steps worked. Most importantly, I think, what steps didn't work and what direction they took as a result of that and how they got involved. And I began in California, and as I would interview, interview these women, I would get calls from, and emails from around the country saying, well, I'm not a mom, but my story can help. Or I work, but my story can help. So Morph Mom is a bit of a misnomer and has morphed into sharing and celebrating women's stories, um, their journeys, and in a way to help others figure out what's out there, how they can do it, sort of as a library of resources, of connections, of support, empowerment. Um, since then, we, we share these stories through Huffington Post, through this weekly radio show, and I'm sure you're going to want to hear this again because there are going to be so many important things you're going to learn. You can listen tomorrow on the on our iTunes podcast on more fun moments. Um, we have classes. We have a conference coming up November 4th with more amazing stories, and we've just started the club, and I encourage you to visit the site and, and look at the club. I have two club members in the audience tonight, and I'm very excited. But the Morph Mom Club is fun. Again, it's a way to stay connected, to share stories, and just sort of um, help others help themselves and figure out what's out there. So without further ado, and enough about me <laughs> and why we're really here and why this topic is so important to everybody, but every Morph Mom out there should be you know, listening intently. Um, again, I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to introduce our representatives from the Montclair Breast Center tonight. It's an all-female private boutique facility in Montclair, New Jersey. Um, they determine the future of breast cancer treatment through prevention. It's a center dedicated to saving lives through breast cancer prevention and early detection. Now, as many of you know or may not know and should know, breast cancer is the number one killer of women ages 40 to 55. And we spoke about this a little bit earlier, and I'm sure many of you this will uh, resonate with. You always remember to go to your OBGYN. You always make that appointment. How many times have you forgotten to schedule or go to or reschedule your mammogram? And it's a terrifying statistic when you realize the severity of missing that one mammogram. Now, my guest, uh, the founder and director of the Montclair Breast Center, Dr. Nancy Elliott, she's one of the first fellow trained breast surgeons uh, in the United States with a medical expertise in the field of breast disease evaluation and treatment. She's been honored by the New Jersey General Assembly and Montclair Economic Development Council for Outstanding Woman of the Year in Science. She received the Luster for Life Award at the 32nd Annual American Cancer Society Diamond Ball. She's been named the top doctor in New Jersey Monthly Magazine. She's appeared on numerous TV uh, shows as a breast cancer specialist as well. My other guest tonight, and welcome, is Dr. Stacey Vidiello. She's a radiologist and a breast imager at the Montclair Center. She's the founder of the website and blog, The Breast Diaries, and we're going to talk about that later. She's appeared on the list of top 10 online influencers making a difference in the battle against breast cancer. She's an advocate for women's rights, informal, informing and being informed of breast density. She's a contributor to The Atlantic and Kevin MD. 
She's been published in the Huffington Post, USA Today, Family Circle, and that's just to name a few. And she, too, has had many TV appearances, including NJ12 and Fox News. So welcome, welcome, welcome. It's an honor and a privilege and absolutely necessary and mandatory to have you guys here and spread the word and help us to figure out what it is we have to do to help ourselves and to help everybody else. So let's begin with how did this begin? How did this center come to fruition? And um, and if I'm right, is it all women doctors involved in the all center? Women doctors, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's an honor. Um, yeah, I'll briefly tell my story. I was uh, one of the first uh, fellowship-trained breast surgeons in New Jersey, and I started uh, my practice as a breast surgeon. And what I saw is women coming to me. A lot of them came with abnormal mammograms. And I knew how to read a mammogram, and I saw that, you know what, you don't really need surgery. You just need a really good mammogram. Uh, a lot of times the mammo re- report would say recommend biopsy. And at that time, mammography was really in its infancy. So I decided to add mammography to my practice and uh, really got busy right away. Um, all my patients with, with breast cancer that I treated would come on a yearly basis, have their mammogram, and I would examine them and do their ultrasound. So we grew from that to now we have three breast surgeons, three dedicated breast imagers, and a PA, and a support staff of 26 women. And how did you get involved with the cancer as well? I mean, I'm sorry, with the center as well. With the center, I, I joined Dr. Elliot eight years ago. Um, I'd been in various practice environments, and I just felt that this kind of center that she had created was really the ideal place to, to do what I do, which is breast imaging, um, early detection, um, minimally invasive biopsies. That's the sort of thing that um, I find you. I didn't, didn't I call you. you? Yes, you did. Yes. I think Kim and I, I, I heard about her, you know, and I called her up because we were looking for someone who was really, really talented and good, and I had gotten her name. And, and so. you even had breast MRI, which is my favorite. So. Yeah. <laughs> and right there. I want to go back to something you said, that mammography was in its early stages. When did that come to be, the, the new method, or, or when did that become established? Well, you know, it's not that mammography was in its early stages. It's that it wasn't really being performed oh. well, okay? There weren't dedicated breast imagers, radiologists, really didn't know how to read mammograms that well. There were a lot of misdiagnoses. The equipment wasn't that great. So um, myself, having done a fellowship and I was trained to read a mammogram, you know, I would get these mammograms, I could clearly see that they were subpar mm-hmm. and that, you know, what women really needed was someone who could do a really good mammogram. Now, what is your, when you were called in, what were you called in to do? Like, what was sort of your specialty and has that stayed the same since you've been there? I am a radiologist, so I'm board certified in all aspects of radiology. Um, and at most practices, the person who reads your mammogram is just came from reading an elbow or a brain scan. It's a general radiologist. Um, what we do at Montclair Breast Center is dedicate our entire practice to breast imaging, um, the, radio- the three radiologists who were there. Um, and, and that really makes a, a huge difference. In, oh, and, difference. and studies have shown that specialty-trained radiologists pick up more breast cancers earlier than non-specialty trained. So it, it really does make a difference. Yeah, there is literature that uh, and research that shows where they compared um, dedicated breast radiologists versus general radiologists, and they clearly found that breast imagers found twice as many cancers as the general uh-huh. radiologists. So will you walk us through, and I'm sure many of you listening and those in the audience today can relate to this, it's a terrifying day, the day that you're going in and you're waiting and you're sitting and you're going through, it's uncomfortable, <laughs> you know, and then you get called back in again. And it's what's 
the unknown is terrifying as well, because you don't know why you're being called back in there. Again, it could be something simple. Could you sort of walk us through just a normal day of how the procedure should go? And what our patients say that when they come to us every year, they really calm down. They really calm down because they say, you know, it's a nerve wracking Mm -hmm. exam, but I know that I'm here. And I know that if I get cancer, it's the earliest possible Mm -hmm. stage. So I feel safe. Our, our goal at this point is really modernizing the mammogram because mm-hmm. a mammogram, honestly, is just a low-dose X-ray of the breast, which came about, they used to use Xerox machines, basically, for the earliest mammograms. Um, and it's not really changed all that much since the 1970s. We can tweak it here and there with digital, with 3D, but it's still the same. It's still an X-ray of the breast. So our goal is to identify the women where a mammogram alone isn't enough Mm -hmm. to find an early cancer. So, for instance, for women with dense breasts, which is a mammographic diagnosis, it's not a physical exam, we identify their density and we determine if they need a second-level screening test so that we have a better shot at actually finding an early cancer. Too many cancers are found way too late. And... Women religiously go for their mammograms and they don't understand how could I possibly have a later late stage diagnosis. I've gone every year and I've been told everything's okay. And they're furious when they, when they find out that they had dense breasts and nobody ever told them that they should possibly have another test in addition to their mammogram. If, if you're going to go to the trouble to be screened, you should be effectively screened. And that's our goal at the center. So early detection. And prevention. So step number one, someone who's never gone before for a mammogram, mammogram, can you sort of walk, or for any sort of breast examination, can you sort of walk us through, you know, okay, I'm going to take notes, say this is sort of what I need to do and and the best way I need to do this. So um, I'll tell you the way that we do it amongst our breast center. So a new patient will come in, um, say she's 40 years old, she's here for her baseline. So she will fill out a tablet going through all of her risk factors for breast cancer, her family history, age of first full-term pregnancy, um, has she had any biopsies before, um, the, yeah, age of first period, um, breast density. We add the breast density mm-hmm. to it. So we end up actually with a number, which is called your lifetime risk of breast cancer. And uh, average woman's life time risk of breast cancer is about 11 percent, which isn't so small, to be honest with you. (laughs) But according to NCCN guidelines, if you have a greater than 20 percent lifetime risk, you're eligible for a breast MRI. But anyway, that's a whole other story because what I wanted to point out is that we do a lot of screening MRIs. A lot of our gals get an MRI every year. Uh, I think I'm correct, but when I did my statistics for last year, we had about 12 to 15 percent of our early breast cancers that we diagnosed were found on the MRI. Really? Yeah. So we find a lot of breast cancer just on MRI. And all of those women whose cancers were found on MRI, none of them needed chemotherapy. So this this is the future of, of breast imaging. And Stacy here is really a big fan. And, and can, well, I, we're all big fans. <laughs> can I interrupt for one second? I want to ask you about this, Stacy, too. So if you're saying the prognosis is that high during the MRI, when insurance companies, and I don't know what, what this is and what their policy on this is, wouldn't they make it easier to get that mammogram to avoid down the road? It would seem, get, the I, yeah. get the MRI. Yeah. Well, that would make logical sense, right. but unfortunately, <laughs> we, we fight this battle every day. Right on the phone, trying to get MRI approved. If if we find that after doing the risk assessment, the patient does have a lifetime risk of 20% or higher, usually the insurance company will go along with it, with getting the MRI in addition to the mammogram. But if it's lower than 20%, they will not. So what we've done just recently, we just implemented something called abbreviated breast MRI, which a regular MRI is about... 30 minutes on the table, and it's a couple thousand dollars. Um, 
abbreviated MRI, we've brought down to about five to 10 minutes on the table. And it's, it has to be unfortunately out of pocket because insurance isn't going to pay for it. And that's $500, which is still expensive, but it's more within reason for some for women who are very motivated to have the MRI, even if they're not truly high risk, but they have dense breath, which masks tons of tumors on a mammogram. So generally speaking, if you were to have just the dense breast, but not qualify for the 20% on the risk assessment, but you may not even know some of the answers on the risk assessment, the breast density would then get you in at least the abbreviated MRI. Well, that's a, a possibility. We've only just begun that in the past month or two. If you would it's at brand least, new. You would at least get, get an ultrasound. Get an ultrasound. An ultrasound. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because 40% of women have dense breasts. So stopping at the mammogram is not effective mm-hmm. screening. Actually, it's just not enough. There's some there's some insurance companies that don't pay for the screening ultrasound. There are yeah, <laughs> yeah. some do. Some consider it wellness part of your wellness visit, yeah. but uh, in others, it can go uh, towards your deductible. So when you go in, and I'm guessing the order would be mammogram, ultrasound, MRI. So you get the risk assessment, uh, and then um, you get your mammogram, which is a 3D. Then you sit down with Dr. Vidiello or one of our uh, breast images, and you actually sit down uh, with them, and you get to view your images. Mm -hmm. So if there's calcifications, if there's any abnormality, you get to see the 3D pictures, and you get that face-to-face contact Mm -hmm. with the doctor who's reading your mammogram. You know, do I have dense breasts? You know, what does that mean? Mm -hmm questions about your risk assessment because they will have the risk assessment that you've done. So you can kind of clarify what your risk is. And then Dr. Vidiello will say, you know, I think you need an ultrasound. And uh, then the ultrasound will be performed that day. And the wonderful thing about Montclair Breast Center is that you do not need a prescription from your anybody. You can just come in off the street because oh, yes. we, we are, we're clinicians. You know, we take full responsibility. If there's any abnormality with your mammogram, we contact, we, we, we solve it right then and there. You, you, nobody gets called back. We don't have anybody going home without their results. Everybody waits if they need additional pictures. It's done while you're there. Your, your gown is still on. You're in the inner waiting room, and we're reading the cases live as they come through. So it's, it's very different than the way mammography is performed almost everywhere else. And is that true, the ultrasound as well? Are you able to get the results? Right away. Wow. Right away. Mm-hmm. And if it's then turned into requiring an MRI, is that true as well, or is that then a sort of longer process? The MRI is uh, on a different floor from where we are, downstairs, and there are thousands of images involved with the MRI. So we need time to really but sit down. But sometimes we do an immediate read. Occasionally. We do yeah. an immediate it's read. An emergency result. Yeah. And we had a patient the other day who had um, needed an MRI, and we were able to sit her in right away. She came from South Jersey. She didn't want to have to come back again yeah. another day. So we looked at the schedule, you know, checked her insurance, and occasionally we perform miracles. <laughs> <laughs> I think you perform miracles every day. I think you're very humble. Um, I have a question, though. So, first of all, I think. Right, what you said would make everyone feel better. It's a terrifying feel, again, that many listening in, in the audience today, when you're looking up at the face of the radiologist or, and you can't see the screen and you're trying to read, like, are they smart? Like, why are they looking that way? They're looking in that one spot again. But if I knew that someone had the bedside manner to come sit with me and explain it, I think, you know, it would just be so much, I, whatever the results were. At least I wouldn't spend right. all that time struggling to try and figure it out on myself. And having a plan, mm-hmm. having a plan, saying, you know what, this looks suspicious, you need a biopsy, most of the time we do it that day. Oh, do you really? Oh, we do it that day. Then Stacy will call me in because uh, we're in the same office, and she said, well, go introduce yourself. Why don't you introduce yourself? And, you know, how do you want to be told of the results? Very important. Do you want us to call you? Do you want to call us? Do you want to come in for the results? So preparing them and giving them an appointment to come in either the next day or 48 hours later. Okay, now you have a, 
we'll see you in 48 hours and we'll discuss the results. Yeah. Wow. I tell patients, if I tell patients that they have breast cancer, I say, you know what? You're only going to have breast cancer for one week <laughs> because we're just able to do things so efficiently. We have our own surgery center. Very often, well, actually, the, the vast majority of our patients avoid who we diagnose with breast cancer who are our own patients. Avoid chemotherapy. There's no chemotherapy involved in their treatment because we find it so early because this works. This individualized approach to finding breast cancer really does work. I, I tell Dr. Elliot all the time, she found the secret sauce. You know, it, <laughs> it, it really works. And... It's amazing, and it's very heartening. That's my favorite part of, of my job is being able to tell somebody that I know it's cancer, but mm -hmm. it's early, and it's going to be taken care of, and you're going to be fine. This is just a bump in the road And you're not going to need chemotherapy, mm -hmm. and you're not going to need a mastectomy. You know, a lumpectomy and a sentinel nose biopsy takes me 45 minutes under local anesthesia with sedation. That's it. No pain. Tylenol. My patients, if they take anything, they yeah. take Tylenol. And mm -hmm. they go home, you know. So with most okay. of the patients that you have diagnosed that needed maybe this, or that have been diagnosed with cancer, how most of them have been very, very early on. And what is, I mean, is it stage one? I don't, what is the terminology? Stage zero or stage one or very early stage two. But to, to draw a comparison, patients who come to us for, say, second opinions, or they haven't been for a mammogram in several years, or they've been taken care of someplace else and somehow fell off the mm -hmm. wagon and didn't go. Those patients that, that come in and we diagnose with breast cancer, more than half of them need chemotherapy. And last yeah. year, only two of our patients needed chemotherapy. So I, our, I, I keep the statistics and I compare you know, our patients and our patients are patients that come every year. We mm -hmm. see them every year, and they follow our directions. <laughs> yeah. And um, we have a 100% early detection rate. That's pretty amazing. And mm -hmm. of our patients, yeah, we had two that needed chemotherapy, but they were early stage one cancers, small, one was eight millimeters, one was seven millimeters, but they were triple negative or HER2 positive. So those ladies, even for, even, mm -hmm. even, you know, aggressive cancers that even though they're small, but they're, they're going to be cured even though they get the chemotherapy. Compared to the 50 women that we saw with breast cancer, came in from the outside that we diagnosed with breast cancer, half of them, so over 20, needed chemotherapy for stage two. For stage three, we had women coming in with metastatic breast cancer. So it's a big deal. You know, and what would your top tips then, like you know, in this secret sauce? It's the early detection prevention, but is it, you know, sign it coming in once a year, or do you sort of say, you know, because your breasts are more dense, you may have to come in more often, or like how does that work? Sort of you preset the plan for them. It's it's all about having a breast doctor, mm -hmm. someone who knows about early detection and prevention and can give you good advice. You know, a lot of our patients come in and they just see Dr. Vidiello, and then Dr. Vidiello will give them good advice. Mm -hmm. If they see me, then I do the, a clinical exam and I give them good advice. Um, so whoever they see, they're, you know, they're getting what is right for them because there, there isn't, as you said, Stacey, there's not a one-size-fits-all. You know, people tell me, when, when, when should we start getting mammograms? Well, you know, let, let, let's have a half an hour discussion about your history, you know, right. you know, um, it really depends. But you, you had some advice about that. Well, I think, you know, for, for most women, it would be starting annual mammography at age 40, sometimes earlier if there are risk factors. Again, that, that has to be determined in a conversation with a doctor who, who understands and gets it. Um, the other issue that's come up frequently recently is when to stop having mammograms. That's an issue because even though Medicare is paying for older women to have a yearly mammogram, a lot of the women are being told by their own doctors that they can stop at a certain age. It might be 70, it might be 75, and we've seen terrible situations 
arise from that, yeah. where a woman who religiously came for her mammogram every year, and when she was 77, her doctor said, oh, you don't have to go anymore. So she stopped. One, one less appointment. Great. She stopped until five years later, she came into us with a lump. And now this 82-year-old working part-time, driving a really good 82, is now battling metastatic breast cancer. She just lost all her hair on chemotherapy. She's terribly sick, and she wasn't sick a day in her life. That could have been prevented because the kind of mammogram she had, too, was not dense. We would have found that cancer when it was tiny, not a golf ball. Mm-hmm. So, you know, these and these things are happening because of there being good, pa- you know, mm-hmm. compliant patients are being told they don't have to go. And I'll tell you, you know, those guidelines are based upon cost savings for the system. It has nothing to do with what's best for the individual person. And I'm not saying, you know, let's go to the nursing home and wheel the mammograms <laughs> and cart around. That's not what I mean. But, you know, everyone deserves to have a plan that's mm-hmm. tailored to them. And... You know, that, that's really... Boring. We're living longer. Mm-hmm. You know, I have 75, 77 grandmas are taking care of their grandkids. They're, you know, fully functional. I said, you know, you know, if you can, you know, walk in here and you're healthy, you know, then you should get a mammogram. Yeah. But it's always funny to me that, you know, they're too old to get a mammogram, you know, at 80, but they're not too old to get chemotherapy. <laughs> You know, so just strange. And in in going back again, prevention, early detection, what is your feeling about self-exams and how often they should be done? And is that still the same as it was when we were growing up and they taught us what to do? So this is one thing that I really feel strongly about. Breast self-exam is really a bad idea. It's a very negative way to relate to your breast once a month to start looking for cancer you know, touching your breast, saying, is there cancer there? Mm -hmm. Uh, No one wants to do that, okay? Breasts are lumpy. It makes women anxious. They'd be in my office every week. This this is what I hear. So um, what what we propose and what we recommend is to incorporate uh, breast awareness, breast massage for health and wellness on a daily basis as part of your morning self-care routine, like brushing your teeth, okay? You wouldn't think, you know, to go to a dentist every six months and then do nothing and Mm -hmm. ignore your teeth. No, it's a daily routine. So breast massage for health and wellness is a lymphatic cleanse, you know, promotes flow, release of toxins, and it gets your hands on your breasts in a really healthy Mm -hmm. way. It has nothing to do. You're not looking for cancer. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we teach. And this is probably a, not the right question, but how quickly can it appear? So let's say, you know, I come to a mammogram August 1st. Or I know this is not a specific answer, but, you know, and I have a year, but could it appear that quickly and grow that quickly? Or I'm, I just, I never quite understood that. Like, well, breast cancer is not one disease. You know, it's 50 different mm-hmm. diseases. So some breast cancers grow slowly, and they could, we've had, breast cancers and and cancers from the outside where we had seen it on a mammogram for three years, you know, really growing very slowly. (laughs) And uh, in other cases, we see a big one centimeter mass and totally was not there last year. So sometimes they explode. Yeah. Sometimes they sit and are sort of dormant, Mm -hmm. but other times it explodes. Mm -hmm. So the safest approach is yearly mammography. We have a chance catch it. And the dose of uh, today's mammogram is the same dose of radiation that you get flying cross country in a plane. And nobody's not flying because they're worried about breast cancer. So uh, it's it's really negligible. It's really silly to be say that you're afraid of the radiation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like a really silly kind of almost uninformed. (laughs) Yeah. So far outweighs any theoretical risk. And it truly is theoretical. Have there been certain instances, you know, let's say there's um, an environmental cause for certain kinds, you know, they would see a certain type of cancer in a certain area based on an environmental reason. Is there anything with that that you've seen? And, you know, the other th- people say, don't put your phone near your breast or don't put your, are these just theories that are out there or is there any evidence behind any of them? 
there's a lot of theories out there. I, I can't say that I've ever seen data on cell phone being near your body causing, you know, truly causing breast cancer based on a peer-reviewed paper. Um, but why would you want to put your cell phone there anyway? <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> True. But, you know, like you stick, I, I just read that somewhere and they said, oh, you can't yeah. stick that in your jog bra. Because just don't do it. But how about other like environmental causes? You know, like everyone anything? Asked me what co- everyone asked me what causes breast cancer. And um, I tell them, well, you know, you'll win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> which, you know, we're trying, you know, we don't know what causes breast cancer. So. Now, now, one thing that or is a fear is the gene, right? We talked us a little bit about the gene and going into also prevention and. Um, uh, one of the things that we do when we first evaluate a, a patient is determine if she's a candidate for genetic testing based upon the NCCN stated guidelines. In that situation, often their insurance will cover genetic testing. So we identify those people. But we offer the blood test for genetic testing to anyone who wants it because it's information that people can really use. And we've been surprised a few mm-hmm. times re- in the past year especially with a few pa- patients who we really didn't expect were going to be gene positive, and they were. And we don't like that not knowing because we want to identify this woman because we want to be really proactive mm-hmm. about carefully screening, making sure they have breast MRI. Sometimes they want to have their ovaries removed. There's always an option of prophylactic mastectomy, which you know doesn't happen very often, but that is an option for some women if they are gene positive. But we have to know it. We can't not have that information and and be able to, you know, really protect those women. Four percent of Ashkenazi Jewish women carry a BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, okay? And when you get it from your dad, if you get the gene from your dad, of course, you can get it from your mom or your dad, uh, that's when it's hidden because men who have the gene generally don't get cancer. They get cancer. So your dad could have it. You wouldn't know. Uh, I mean, it's just, I'm talking about a patient um, that we had who was Ashkenazi Jewish, and um, she had no family history, so she didn't. Um, so she didn't get genetic testing. She didn't qualify. Then she got breast cancer. It was triple negative. She got tested, and she was BRCA1 positive. She got it from her dad. Her dad had a brother, and he didn't have any kids, and uh, they didn't really know anything about their grandparents. So there wasn't a lot of history mm-hmm. to go by. Yeah, so uh, since that time, and that was several years ago, and now we have signs up all over that all Ashkenazi Jewish women should just get tested. I don't care if you have no family yeah. history, okay? And just get tested. Will insurance cover that blood test? Only if uh, there's certain criteria that the NCCN has, you have to go through their whole family history of all sorts of cancers, not just breast and ovarian, and kind of be able to identify the factors that are in these guidelines that are stated, um, approved, that insurance companies go by basically Mm -hmm. to approve. 23andMe will test for the gene. Oh, really? Yep. And it's $200, like Myriad Genetics charges $200 to do it. So I just tell them just do it. Just do it. It used to be thousands of dollars. It used to be $2,000. Thousand, yeah. But now it's down to, yeah, they brought it down to 200 or 250 And you mentioned two different variations of the hearing, the BRCA1 and the BRCA2, I think you said. Is one more severe than the other? or Yeah, BRCA1 is... Uh, tends to occur in younger women and tends to be more aggressive breast cancers in general. So those are the ones you really, you know, want to notice. And when you find them, you know, it does change your life because women that have the gene have a 60, 70 percent chance of getting breast cancer in their life. So it's, it's a big deal for them. Yeah, very big. Right, especially in terms of planning pregnancy and having mm-hmm. children and making sure that, you know, they, they kind of have, they know what they have to do. Um, but it's also important to realize, though, only 10% of the cancers we diagnose have any genetic component. Yeah, probably less than 10. Probably, probably less than 10. Really? Probably less than 10. So that's why when, when people say, well, I don't really go for regular mammograms. I have no family history. It's not my family. I'm, I'm okay. And they don't realize that 
80 to 90 percent of the women that we diagnose have no family history or, or minimal, say, a great grandmother or, or nothing. So, you know, it's not protective to not have the family history. And it's important not to make that uh, to rest on those laurels of, you know, you don't need to go. Now, the work you do is amazing, and we can't thank you enough for it. And, I mean, we're grateful. We all should be grateful every minute of every day what you're doing for us. And I'm sure the cases that you have seen have just been unbelievable. But is there one or two instances or cases that you had that just reaffirm every single thing that you do, something that really sticks out? And I'm sure there are many of them, so I don't know if there is just one. But I don't know, a story to share about Again, we know you're saving lives all the time, but I don't know. Is there one that sticks out with you guys? There are good stories every week. <laughs> well, that's a good answer. <laughs> and Dr. Elliott has love notes from thousands of patients oh, yeah. who are so grateful. Oh. She gets these flower arrangements and <laughs> baskets and tickets to plays. <laughs> it's unbelievable. She's like a rock star. <laughs> Because she, because people are so grateful mm-hmm. that they know their lives could have been totally turned upside down if we'd found their cancer later. But this yeah. is what I do. I make sure when they come for their post-op appointment, I look to see who really found their cancer on the mammogram. So one of the patients, when she came, I said, you know what, let's go to Dr. Vidiello and thank mm-hmm. her for finding your breast cancer. And they... And they love that. They go, oh, yes, let me, let's thank her. Because, you know, I didn't find the breast cancer. You know, Dr. Vidiello did or Dr. Lee did or Dr. Quackenbush. So, yeah, so that's what we try to keep it, try to really give the radiologists mm-hmm. some of the glory <laughs> that they deserve. We're the ones who work in the dark room. <laughs> but at least with, at our center, the, we all actually talk to the patients. They mm-hmm. are our patients as well. We have relationships, nearly relationships with our patients. And it's very different than other fields in radiology where you are in the dark room all yeah. day just dictating and you never speak to a patient. And there are many personalities in radiology who prefer that. But this is very different. This is really taking care of patients. And, you know, you don't need to have a problem to come to Montclair Breast Center. Mm-hmm. In fact, we want people who are healthy that just want to have a breast doctor, to have a mammogram and an ultrasound, to have screening, to learn how to protect themselves against, you know, ever getting breast cancer because it can happen to you, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, I had stage zero breast cancer, you know. I had my mammogram eight years ago. Uh, calcification. They poked needles into me. Dr. Hertz operated on me and I uh, took, you know, tamoxifen. But, you know, when I was diagnosed, I didn't say, well, I wasn't surprised. Mm-hmm. I, like I said, well, why not me? I mean, I have no family history, but, you know, I, I wasn't surprised, you know, but I was perfectly comfortable, you know, that, you know, I was in the right place. <laughs> well, I think you make the unknown, a much less scary world for what you're saying. Like, it's really scary to go in and not know and try and read minds and read expressions. But the fact that the bedside manner that accompanies what you were doing, I think, is probably life-changing for these women that come in there. And when, when, you're, looking at the, when you're looking at the screen and looking through all of the, the files, do you, can you pretty much identify when you're something suspicious, when you think it might be? I don't know. I always yeah. wondered that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends. You know, sometimes we can look at something and say, oh, boy, this is not going to mm-hmm. be good. Uh, other times we really rely on the pathologist. You know, we need the needle to get some tissue, and we send it off, and we have a result usually within a day, sometimes two, and we call the patient as soon as we as we get the result. Um, so it's really yeah. sometimes yes. But other yeah. times, especially Sometimes, with the little yeah. MRI lesions that we find, they might or might not. Yeah. Sometimes and you can say it's low suspicion, maybe only 10%, but that's not low enough. Yeah. So we, you know, we have to buy. We try to be really honest with the patients. Yeah. You know, we t- we'll try to give them a percentage, you know, maybe 10% chance, but, you know, it has to be biopsied or, you know, likely, you know, it's more likely. So, uh, yeah, a lot of talking goes on. So... And for those of you listening, we're live at the Coco in 
from in New Jersey tonight, again, with Montclair Breast Center founder and director, Dr. Nancy Elliott, and Dr. Stacey Vidiello, radiologist and breast imaging at the center. Um, does that, so with our live audience today, now you guys can't see it, but I will relate the question to you. We have a couple questions in the audience. So, my mom has breast cancer, and, and uh, she so my mom had breast cancer at the age of 33, and she died by the time I was nine. So I'm absolutely mortified with, you know, all of this. And so <clears throat> I've been going for mammograms since I was 30 every year. And um, and I had, like, a scare a couple of years ago. It took them three months to sort of figure this thing out, which was absolutely crazy. Um, somebody wasn't reading the x-ray, x-ray correctly. So I actually feel like coming to see you guys and checking this out because, um, <laughs> um, but anyway, I did 23andMe and it said something like negative for the BRAC, you know, and they're like, you have to watch this video before. And I was like, oh, you know, and they said not all variants are tested. So what does that mean? Because they were trying to get me to do genetic testing, but at the same time, the doctor is like, well, you're not really at a risk for it because I don't drink, I don't smoke, but I never had any kids, whatever. So you know, I really didn't want to get genetic testing. So is that 23andMe thing pretty accurate? Even if it says BRAC? Not necessarily. Okay. So not necessarily. So your mom had breast cancer at what age? She was dead at 37. Yeah. Was yeah. Before. So you should have genetic testing. I mean, you should have genetic testing. There's, 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 there's really no downside. And you use medical, it's a medical kind of grade genetic testing. 23andMe is really for people who really don't want genetic testing. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned it for people that might not want genetic testing, but really you should have genetic testing. Your insurance will cover it. You want to know if you have the gene. You know, it's not just BRCA1 and BRCA2. There are other, you know, go ahead. Actually, I don't want to know, but it's difficult. Okay, here's the thing. I kind of feel the reason I went to it because I'm like, if I know I have that gene, I, I'm prone to anxiety, and then it's just like, oh, when's it going to hit, you know? It's like, so, like, what is, you said the percentage, if you have the gene, what is the percentage you actually get it? And, and the question was, what is the, if you have the gene, is, is there even a way to determine the percentage of actually coming Well, out? you know, this is a long conversation, <laughs> okay? You know, these are the long conversations that I have. And what you do is you have to build trust with your patients. They have to trust you. And you have to explain to them all the advantages of getting tested and, and you know, listen to those reasons, you know, and then, just, and then decide. Most of the time, I don't know. I think I convince everyone. You know, <laughs> I do have patients like you that don't want to get tested, but eventually I get to them. <laughs> and we have one more question, or two more questions. Yep. We have a few minutes left. Um, so quick question here. So um, my mom had breast cancer at like 40 or 42, um, and she had stage three but was cured from chemotherapy, mastectomy, all that. Um, I've been getting mammograms since I was 40. I turned 50 this year. I asked, can I please finally get an MRI done? I'd like to get. And they said, no, you're not at high risk. Insurance is not going to cover this for you. And I don't have peace of mind just because, like, my cousin, same family, her mother had breast cancer as well. Um, my cousin goes, and she is told that she's age zero. It's a spot, not even stage zero. They won't even classify it as cancer in her left breast come back in six months and we'll look at it again. She's like, no, I want an MRI. And she's 52. And they did the MRI on her. And when they did her MRI, it was actually stage one cancer in the opposite breast, not diagnosed from mammography because she insisted, being the Italian obnoxious, you know, like we are kind of like fight for ourselves, she insisted that they do it and get it done. So here again, I mean, it wasn't the late stage, but so how do you have, how do you, do you for like they're telling me insurance won't pay for it. So how do I get a MRI at 50? Well, that's, that's what I was explaining that we, the last, within the last month or two, we've introduced something to our practice called abbreviated breast MRI, which is the shortened scan 
and it's five hundred dollars. So, you know, rather than the the retail price. And honestly, you know, I I've been very um, successful in getting insurance companies to pay for your MRI. And you have a mother with breast cancer. Do your risk assessment. I bet you you're over 20% lifetime, you know, did, you yeah, know, do it the right way. Yeah. Um, so, and I recommend it. And I'm your doctor and they deny it. And then I do a peer to peer, peer to peer, get on that phone and I fight for you. And then they, it gets approved. So, you know, really stories like that get me so angry. How dare they? How dare they tell you uh, your insurance isn't going to cover it so that, I mean, is that now who's determining our health care, our insurance company? Okay. I, I, it's like, when did this happen? And, and why so much with breast cancer, you know? You know, I guess something's going on here. <laughs> and we have another question from the audience. Well, first of all, bless you both for the wonderful, caring treatment you give women. And I guess the two things that stand out for me are that we all need a good breast doctor and that if you do have cancer, going to you will only have it for a week. <laughs> <laughs> so how kind. Um, I guess my question was similar or just a reiteration of that is that if you come into your center, if I come into your center and not happy with the first round of tests and I want to be more proactive while I'm there do we contact insurance how do you handle like keep fighting to the next level so that you know being a mother of three kids in college what's going to be my you know overall cost like, they want me to live but not that much <laughs> <laughs> well I think the right way. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I think the most important thing is for a f to have a full assessment. Like you're saying, if you go to a breast doctor, then just to have the complete picture put together so that we can recommend the appropriate thing for you. Everybody doesn't need an MRI. We have mammograms that are clean as a whistle, and we can say with close to 100% certainty there is absolutely nothing going on in that breast. So, you know, that. For that person, a mammogram alone each year is enough. But it, it's really an individual determination. I can't believe we're out of time right now. We could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. I can't thank you enough for coming in. I can't thank the Montclair Breast Center enough, Dr. Stacy Vidiello and Dr. Nancy Elliott for coming in tonight and helping us weed our way through this incredibly scary topic that became a little less scary today. A little less scary and made us, I think, a little bit more proactive and a little bit more informed, a lot more informed. And I just can't thank you enough. I can't thank the Coco enough for allowing us to have the show live here tonight with a live audience of amazing women. It was just incredibly, just a great night. And Victory Priar for bringing us all together. Thank you so much as well. Um, a great, great night, a great, great lesson with great, great women. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But before we go, tell us the best way for people to get in touch with you, what they should do. They need to get on this immediately. <laughs> um, well, we're in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, we're called Montclair Breast Center, and you can just look us up on the Internet. And just in case, now, that if someone's listening from a different state or a different country or wherever everyone out there is listening from tonight, they couldn't physically get to you, but is it possible to ever reach out to you? Or I don't know if that's even a possibility. Well, we have a um, we have a email address, and you can definitely uh, you know uh, put questions in. And one of the things we're actually investigating is um, doing um, you know FaceTime consults mm -hmm. and, and telephone consults, which I think can be really appropriate in a lot of instances. Uh, with with breast problems, as long as I don't have to examine you, <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> so with about thirty seconds left, would you each give us just a word of advice, a tip, something you will leave us with? I think at this stage of the game, knowing your breast density is one of the most important things for anybody to come away with from this conversation, because without knowing if you have a readable mammogram 
and knowing that maybe you should be getting additional tests in addition to your mammogram in order to be effectively screened, then we haven't done our job. And too many women do not know their breast density. And I just want to mention quickly to you about the breast diaries. So how can women reach out to you and, and read the breast diaries? It's, it's online. It's thebreastdiaries.com. And that would talk about breast density and all sorts of posts and articles about all different topics related to early detection, uh, MRI especially, uh, biopsies, all, all sorts of things. Okay. And what would your final words of advice or tip? Uh, I think that uh, we need to empower women to uh, demand more, ask more questions, be more demanding, don't give up. Oh. How do I follow that up? <laughs> I can't. But with a thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody go out, get your mammogram, call them immediately, schedule it, um, and we'll see you next week. Good night, everyone. When it comes to providing guide dogs for people who are blind or visually impaired, one national...